Hello everybody, thank you very much for joining us. A very warm welcome from all of us at the William Morris Gallery. My name is Sophie Alonso. I'm the Cultural Learning and Skills Manager and I look after our education and public programme at the Gallery. I'm very excited to be here today um, talking with you all and having all of our speakers with us today talking about Young Poland, the arts and crafts movement that lasted from 1890s to 1914. We're going to be looking at that movement and setting it in some context in Europe at the other arts and crafts movements that were happening across Europe at the time and also looking at contemporary artists and how they have been influenced um, by the arts and craft movement in Poland today. Some of you may know that we have an exhibition at the William Morris Gallery about Young Poland. We're based in Walthamstow in East London and the exhibition is absolutely fantastic. I won't go into many details because we're going to have a fantastic virtual tour by one of the curators of the exhibition a bit later on today. But it's a really beautiful exhibition. It's one of the largest ones we've done at the gallery and has been a huge success. It's actually only on for one more day. So you've got to the rest of the day and tomorrow to get a chance to go and see it if you haven't already. And if you're able to get to Walthamstow in East London, I really would recommend a visit to the William Morris Gallery to see that. Um, we also today will be talking, as well as having that virtual tour, we'll be hearing from other curators at the gallery talking more broadly about the arts and crafts movement across Europe, as well as looking more closely at the movement in Poland and looking at how the movement relates to William Morris and, and how some of the artists and crafts people involved in the movement were inspired by Morris as well. As well as that, we're very excited to be joined by some contemporary artists from Poland talking about how the arts and crafts movement in Poland influenced their own practice. So we're really excited to hear from those artists later today. You probably noticed from our um, email that unfortunately one of the artists is, is unwell, so she's no longer able to join us. That's Tamara from the March in Rusak studio. I will send with you, um, send to you after this talk, um, possibly on Monday. Uh, a breakdown of what she would have been speaking about. I have a link uh, to the website that talks through the sculpture that Martin Rusak made to go outside the William Morris Gallery for the exhibition. It's a really beautiful piece with a really nice um, design process behind it and some metaphorical thinking around rebirth, which is very relevant to the movement, but also I think we can all relate to that um, metaphor at the moment with the pandemic. So I'll send that through to you. Um, and also there is a slight change in the schedule as well. Our two artists are swapping over at the end of the day. So Paulina will speak at the end and uh, Kasia will speak before Paulina. So just a bit of housekeeping now before we, we get started. The session's going to be recorded. Um, um, in case you're not familiar with a webinar, uh, no one can see your face or hear you. We can just see what you write in the chat. So you won't be recorded yourself. We'll put this on YouTube and I'll also send that link out to you as well when, once it's ready. So you can share it with friends and, and obviously revisit the talks that you really enjoyed today. We're also gonna have opportunity for questions throughout the day. So please do put these in the chat. If you put them in the chat and then uh, we will go through as many of them as we possibly can and just write them in as soon as they come to you. Um, you don't need to wait until the kind of designated question time. Uh, there's going to be some breaks throughout the day. So there'll be a break from 12.15 to 12.45 for lunch after our first two talks. Then we'll have two more talks and a very short comfort break from 1.40 to 1.50. And then we'll have our final talk at the end of the day. Just a very quick reminder to our speakers as well to keep to time today. It's really important that we get through everybody and give everybody a, a fair chance at speaking. We've got lots of exciting things to get through. So a very quick reminder on that. And finally, uh, just to remind everybody as well that um, we have time for questions, which I can just see that actually I've already covered, so apologies about that. We have time for questions throughout, but also at the end of, this, of the session, there will be time to ask any other questions to any of the other speakers if you didn't have a chance to ask it first time round or something came to you a bit later. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first two speakers. We're going to hear from Rowan Bain and Rasheem Inglesby. They're both curators at the William Morris Gallery. Rowan's going to be speaking to you about the um, arts and crafts movement in Europe and speaking, speaking about some of the context of William Morris and how that relates somewhat to the, to the Young Poland movement. And Rasheem's going to be going through um, a virtual tour of the exhibition. Um, and she's also going to have uh, an opportunity at the end to give you a very exclusive look at some of the behind the scenes information that is a very, very exclusive opportunity for everybody here today. 
So without any further ado, I'm very, very excited to hand you over to Rowan. Hello, thanks for joining us. Um, so my name is Rowan Bain and I'm Principal Curator of the William Morris Gallery. So in this talk, I'm going to give a broad introduction to the arts and craft movement, so its origins in Britain and the mid 19th century, and its influence in the artistic movements and styles that emerged in Europe and North America between the 1880s and the First World War, and later Japan in the first half of the 20th century. So the idea of this is really to set the context for the preceding talks on the Young Poland movement that Rasheen and Julia will be given. So the arts and crafts movement was not homogenous. What it's come to mean is in Britain is different to what occurred in Vienna, Munich, Paris or Paris. But there is commonality and it's that in the ideas and the values and the consideration for how things are made <clears throat> and who makes them that makes it possible to talk about and visualise the things that made this a movement and one that still has a lasting impact on what we appreciate today. So in order to understand how the arts and crafts movement in Britain in the mid 19th century started, we have to acknowledge the effect of the Industrial Revolution and, and its effect on the standards of manufacturers goods in Britain. So while there was amazing innovation and life improving progress, sometimes in the race to profit, <coughs> excuse me, from innovative and new manufacturing techniques, manufacturers sometimes competed for customers by producing novelty products made from cheap materials. So, and also whilst this was um, in, this, in this kind of com competitive market, sometimes excessive embellishment was used to disguise shoddy manufacturing. So whilst the Great Exhibition of 1851, which you can see in this picture in Crystal Palace, was hailed as a triumph of British innovation, many critics were dismayed by the poor quality of some of the British exhibits. The Victorian novelist George Gissing used the Crystal Palace exhibition to draw negative connotations in his work the netherworld, and he describes the Great Exhibition as a circus show for the slaves of industrialism, which represented the evils of decadence. So the exhibition of 1851 revealed that England was definitely, was obviously dominant in the Industrial Revolution in its manufacturing and its machinery, but without, with its rival probably being America, but in the realm of taste and artistry, France continued to reign with its Limoges enamels, its Lyon silks and Sèvres porcelain. So in Victorian Britain, all areas of society were to undergo reform, from work, education, to how the poor were dealt with, and design was no different. And so the latter half of the century, following on from the Great Exhibition, has been termed an age of reform, as design reform, and key figures such as John Ruskin, Henry Cole, and designers Owen Jones and William Morris attempted to influence the standards of production, and elevate design and art in Britain. So here we can see John Ruskin. Um, John Ruskin, along with William Morris, is seen as one of the founders and the leader of the British arts and crafts movement. Born in 1819, Ruskin was a writer, philosopher, art critic, and a polymath of Victorian, the, the Victorian era. He produced hundreds of architectural drawings and watercolours, one of which you can see here um, of Venice, detailing architectural styles that he admired. But it was his moral philosophy that was to impact the direction of the arts and crafts movement. His most famous written work is called The Nature of Gothic, and this was a chapter in a book which you can see illustrated um, in the, the Stones of Venice in the bottom left corner. So in The Nature of Goth Gothic, he set out his two main arguments. So that in medieval art, it's possible to see how craftsmen were masters of their own work. Through the idiosyncrasies and the imperfections and the creative freedom that these medieval craftspeople were allowed, they created the most beautiful art. Secondly, that by working in cooperation with each other rather than in competition, they were able to achieve a higher standard of work and which was most importantly good for society. So these were um, 
concept. But within the context of industry, we should the necessity of human labour and also how intensely competitive and divisive manufacturing was, Ruskin's ideas were to become the bedrock of the arts and crafts movement, not just in Britain, but across the world. So William Morris um, was to take Ruskin's ideas and to manifest them in his designs and through his commercial business. So through his firm Morris & Co, he rejected new methods of production, such as synthetic dyes and machine printing, in favour of natural dyeing and hand block printing to create his fabrics and wallpapers. And in this photo, you can see um, the woodblock printing um, workshop in his factory, Merton Abbey. Morris collaborated with his friends on the design and production of his products. And at Merton Abbey, he attempted to create an environment that was conducive to a creative artistry. Also, it's very important to look at his inspiration from the natural world. So he organized and adapted natural motifs in his repeating patterns. And here you can see um, one of his first designs, the design for trellis wallpaper on the left, um, which, which kind of takes nat natural forms and unifies it um, in this, in this repeating pattern. And this is very much taking this influence from the natural world, which he saw as under threat from the industrial um, revolution of the preceding century. So um, Morris, like Ruskin, was to formulate his philosophy in writing and teaching that was disseminated wild, um, widely. And William Morris became a figure very well known across, um, across the world for his, his writing and his, and his his thoughts about design. So at the same time as Morris, other groups and designers were also emulating and transforming with Morris's and Ruskin's ideas um, about the hand process and the value of craftspeople. And there are many, many examples of this, but I just thought it'd be worth focusing on one person, C.R. Ashby, um, who set up the Guild of and the School of Handicrafts in the East End of London. Um, and I'll mention, come back to Ashby later. Um, Ashby set up um, the Guild of School in, in School of Handicrafts in the East End. And then in 1902, he moved out to the Cotswold village called Hooking Camden. And this was to create a kind of model artist community. So here you can see the workshop um, in Chipping Camden and an example of um, Ashby's um, metalwork and, and his beautiful decanter. So another way of looking at the arts and crafts movement in Britain is the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, which started in 1882 and was particularly influential in showcasing the artistic achievements of craftsmen and also women. And this was another important shared principle of the arts and crafts movement. So the society aimed to level the disparity between the fine arts, by which we mean painting and sculpture, and handicrafts, such as this embroidery, which you can see here, which is made by William Morris's daughter, May Morris. So by showcasing them within the context of an exhibition and by crediting the names of the people that actually made them, they wanted to elevate um, craft. So sometimes craft had been shown as something that you know, you didn't know who actually made the product, but the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society wanted to, to change that. And that's something that um, was taken up by many um, crafts and arts people in, in Europe, which I'll go on to talk about. So now it's time to move away from Britain and cross the English Channel and see what was going on in Europe. So um, as I mentioned at the start, um, I'm not suggesting that what was happening in Britain was to kickstart other movements in the rest of Europe, rather that ideas ebbed and flowed, permeated, permeated through the thoughts of artists and craftspeople and encouraged possibility, thought and debate. And it provided a visual resource and was adapted, but to meet the very specific social and national needs of those um, craftspeople in the particular countries they were working in. So here we've got some examples of Germany. And Germany was to have probably the most long lasting impact on design in the 20th century. 
Like the designers of the British arts and crafts movement, reformers in Germany reacted against what they saw as the degrading forces of industrialization and urbanization. And they wanted a greater unity between art and everyday life and an improvement in domestic and social life. This became known as Jugendstil, and that's the German counterpart of the Art Nouveau, the Art Nouveau movement, which had started in France and Belgium. It coincided with an interest in industrial design and applied arts, as well as the desire to improve German products in order to compete with the international market. Like the British arts and crafts movement, they valued a high standard of design and the concept of fitness for purpose and honest construction. German designers did not reject mass production, however, but sought to create designs that were appropriate for the new technologies that were being developed. So this led to a simplified functional type of design with less ornamentation than that of their British counterparts, making the products affordable. So new workshops modelled loosely on British examples rose up in Munich, Dresden and Darmstadt. So the Vereinigten Werkstätten in Munich, founded in 1898, which you can see examples of here, were particularly successful in promoting the applied products through exhibition and also retail. And they concentrated on furnishings for the home, but whilst they promoted handicraft, they embraced all types of production that paved the way for the use of machinery. So the artists who were employed by the Werkstätten were instrumental in, in establishing the direction of design in Germany that would ultimately result in the Deutsche Werkbund, which then um, out of that came the Bauhaus and the modernist design movement that we, that we saw in the 20th century. So in Vienna, the formation of the Vienna Succession in 1897 was set up in reaction to the highly conservative traditional art of the imperial capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the artist who started in the painter um, was its president. Vienna Succession's work is often referred to as the Austrian version of Jugendstil, the German term for Arnebeau. The successionists created the first dedicated permanent exhibition space, which you can see here, for contemporary art of all types in the West. So like the Arts and Crafts Exhibition, exhibition Society, which I referred to earlier, they wanted to narrow the gap between the prestige, between the fine arts of painting and sculpture and architecture and the decorative and graphic arts. And the eighth succession exhibition in the winter of 1900 was dedicated to international crafts. And the British designer, um, Charles Robert Ashby, who I referred to earlier, along with Charles Rennie Mackintosh and his peers and the Parisian art house La Maison Moderne, all made some sense appearances at this exhibition and were very influential. Um, in the same year as the successionists, Joseph Hossmann, Coleman Mosser and the banker and collector Fritz Vandorfer founded the Wiener Werkstatter, following the example of Ashby's Guild of Handicraft, who Hoffman had actually visited the previous year. So although the British and Austrian workshops were different in their output, they were both committed to valuing the handmade, excluding the use of machines. So Rasheem will talk further about the Krakow workshops in which it's further possible to see the influence of the Wiener Werkstatter. Now here you can see the sits machine or machine for sitting and translated into English, um, this chair, which was designed by Hoffman for the Perkstorf for San Sanatorium in Vienna. And the chair has very much in common with an adjustable back chair that was designed by William Morris. And the sanatorium was one of the most important commissions for um, the Wiener Werkstatter and represents one of her um, Hoffman's earliest ex experiments in unifying a building and its furnishings as a total work of art. And this again is a concept that's explored in the, um, in the Young Poland exhibition. So moving away from Vienna, um, Central Europe, as well as Scandinavia and Russia, um, the arts and crafts movement in these um, regions was centred around the revival and the celebration of indigenous crafts, including wood carving, textiles, domestic architecture and ceramics. So in Hungary, Poland and the Czech regions, where they were all variously under foreign powers, 
the revival of peasant folk art and literature was manifestly part of a desire to reclaim a sense of national identity. And this is quite important to distinguish between France or um, Germany or Britain or, um, or Austro-Hungary. Hungary. So unlike these heavily industrial um, countries, um, Hungary, Poland and the Czech regions were not yet industrialized. And this is a really important difference when looking at the arts and crafts movement in Eastern and Central Europe. So peasant culture represented for the movement a model for an alternative contemporary world. And for some, it fulfilled this romantic notion of socialist ideal that the artists in, say, Britain were looking to kind of champion through this mixture of um, arts and crafts and politics. And this was a particularly attractive to artists like Ashby and designers and social and the designer and socialist Walter Crane. So in 1900, Walter Crane visited Hungary, um, which resulted in the exhibition of his work at the Museum of the Applied Arts. And Crane was particularly influenced, um, and it was a particular influence on the Hungarian graphic artist Karolu Kos, which you can see here, um, the comparison of their work. So moving away from Europe and um, the Atlantic now, looking at America and the arts and crafts societies and experimental, experimental communities there, were very much modelled on British examples and they were first established in and around Massachusetts and New York um, in around the 1890s. And American designers looked to their native heritage, also landscape and climate, and their practice was generally more commercial than that of their European counterparts. So in America, class distinction and anti-industrialism was less rooted in culture. So consequently, and perhaps paradox paradoxically, arts and crafts reached a broader section of society because of this. So one of the most notable artists was Gustav Stickley, who based his workshop in Syracuse in New York State. And Stickley's designs reflected his belief in honesty, simplicity and usefulness. And he um, he wanted to create um, reasonably priced pieces of furniture to furnish the homes of working people. And this unadorned aesthetic became known as the craftsman style, a look disseminated in his magazine, The Craftsman. Later on in Chicago, arts and crafts was particularly influential for designers like Frank Lloyd Wright, who with his um, contemporaries produced kind of radical architecture um, which introduced revolutionary changes in domestic design, opening up interiors and bringing in nat native plants and abstract uh, motifs into, uh, into the home. Now, finally, I'm going to look at briefly at Japan and the Minge movement. So this was led by the philosopher and critic Yanagi Soetsu. And the Minge movement in Japan was officially um, established in 1926, so later than in the film. The philosophy introduced the idea of direct perception, which was the intuitive ability to discover beauty that was born rather than made. And it centered on a belief that humble goods could express fine aesthetic qualities. And the movement advocated the use of historical folk crafts as a template for the production of domestic objects assembling extensive collections of indigenous pieces. And the Minge movement championed the work of artists, craftspeople by preserving and raising the standards of the kind of traditional artisanal craft production that was threatened by industrialization. So Hamada Shoji, who set up the Leach studio in actually in St. Ives in Cornwall with Bernard Leach in the 1920s, um, Kawaii Kanjiro and Tomimoto Kenkichi are regarded as its leaders. And Minge designers are often created in model rooms in an attempt to show the lessons of the craft. 
that's a very rapid um, interaction between thoughts. So that is part of an understanding of this concept. And whilst this just touches the surface and shows how distinct each country's artistic identity and heritage is, I believe it is possible to see commonalities. So the rejection of the most negative effects of industrialization, the, the anonymity of the artists and the culture, as well as the legend of the and to elevate the mood of the last person and promote new value in society. Manufacturing or even virtually, we still treasure what we can hold and touch and value the human connection we have with something that's expertly handmade. And this is in no sm small part down to the arts and crafts movement and those who've championed its values. Thank you very much for listening. I'll pass you back to Sophie now. Thank you very much, Rowan. That was a very concise and informative overview of the movement um, in different corners of the world. Just a quick note um, to all the attendees on this call, apologies for some sound issues that we had there. I hope you managed to get um, the, the gist of, of Rowan's talk. And if, if you would like, I'll ask Rowan and we can share the slides with you. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much again, Rowan. That was great. So we're now going to hand over to Rasheen. As I said, she's going to speak to you um, about the exhibition that we have about Young Poland and give you a virtual tour of it. And she'll then move on to talk about some behind the scenes information about the exhibition. So over to Rasheen. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Roisin Inglesby and I am curator at the William Morris Gallery. Uh, I'm also one of the co-curators of the Young Poland exhibition. And today I'm going to give you um, what I hope is a kind of virtual tour of the exhibition. I know that some of you will have seen it, some of you will not. Um, so I'm trying to bridge both of those groups. Um, but what I would like to do is kind of walk you around the exhibition virtually and explain some of the, the key themes behind the, the rationale behind the exhibition uh, and some of my favourite objects and also how this relates to some of the wider issues of the arts and crafts movement. So I'm going to do two little talks. Uh, the first one is about the exhibition, as you would see it if you were coming. And the second one is just a very short behind the scenes um, little sneak preview, I guess, into what it takes to put on an exhibition of this scale, um, because that's some of the questions that we get asked quite a lot uh, when people come to the gallery is, you know, how does this work? So uh, that'll be the second part. Um, but firstly, I would like to start just by introducing you to the William Morris Gallery. So again, some of you will have been there, some will, some will not, um, but the William Morris Gallery is a um, 18th century building in East London. Uh, as you, this is what you can see here. Um, it is where William Morris lived when he was a teenager. So that was actually um, about a hundred years after the building was made. So the gallery is not a Morris building as such. It wasn't designed by him. It wasn't decorated by him. But because this is where he lived, uh, this is where the museum was founded uh, in, in the 1950s. Um, and this is the largest and only uh, public collection devoted to William Morris and his life and work. So we try and do two things at the gallery. One is to talk about Morris um, exclusively. But the other is to bring out links between Morris and other arts and crafts movements around the world, both historic and contemporary. So as Rowan explained earlier, um, there are a huge number of links between Morris and sort of the international arts and crafts movement. Uh, and Young Poland uh, is one of these lesser known arts and crafts movements um, that I think, especially in England, has been very much underrepresented. So... This is the exhibition and we are introducing Young Poland as an arts and crafts movement for the first time really. Um, about half of the objects in the exhibition came um, out of storage in Poland. So they're not even common objects in Poland and almost none of them have ever been shown in the UK before. When Polish uh, or Young Poland objects have been shown in the UK, it tends to be in the context of fine art and in the context of paintings. Um, but actually what we've tried to do with the exhibition is really think about it as an arts and crafts movement um, and, and draw out lots of the connections between Morris and material culture and kind of the lesser known, less obvious 
aspects of the Young Poland movement. But to start off, uh, this, is the, this is what you would have seen if you came to the exhibition, um, and we are greeted by this fantastic uh, painting by Stanislav Wisbianski. It's actually an oil painting, uh, even though it looks it looks like it could be um, be pastel. It has this really uh, beautiful, delicate sort of uh, ethereal uh, tone to it. Visbianski actually used pastels most commonly, uh, and so it's interesting that even when he's using oils, he's he has this kind of pastel um, atmosphere. And this is to set the scene. So even for those of you who have been to Poland, you won't have been to Poland uh, in the 19th century, which is when this exhibition starts. And in the 19th century, Poland was not the country that we know it. It was divided between three um, sort of occupying powers, which was Russia, Prussia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and as a result, uh, Polish language was subjugated. Polish people did not have political autonomy. Um, you know, there was a real period of oppression. Um, and in the face of this um, political non-existence, the Young Poland movement uh, strives to maintain Polish cultural identity and maintain the country's integrity through other means uh, and most specifically through art. So there's a lot of symbolism inherent in a lot of young Polish painting. Um, and the, the painting by Wisbianski here, you can see, uh, it shows Wawel Castle, which is um, a, a, you know, a very significant uh, place for, for Polish people. It was the sort of the ancient seat of Polish kings. And at this stage, it had been occupied by the Austro-Hungarian troops who were using it as barracks. And so you see the atmosphere of this painting. It's, you know, it's sort of, it's a little bit gloomy. It's a little bit melancholy. You know, it's, a, it's got a sort of a sadness to it, certainly. But there are elements of hope. So even though it's dark, there is a lantern glowing faintly in the middle. So there is, there is light. And even though it's, it's probably nighttime, there's a little bit of, of dawn in the air. So maybe, you know, maybe the day is coming. And even though it's obviously winter, if you look at the trees closely, you can see buds. So there is new life. There is something perhaps coming, something better coming, even though at the moment, it, it's certainly still a, a dark and, and melancholy time. And this is another archetypal picture that you would see when you came into the exhibition. So this shows, uh, this is by Joseph Mehoffer, who is another of the, the most significant young Poland artists. Um, and Mehoffer here is introducing us to the, the fundamental characteristics of young Poland art. So you see on the left hand side, this very um, beautifully dressed, very sophisticated woman who is the figure of art. And she looks very classically kind of Art Nouveau or, you know, she, she's very uh, sophisticated, very much sort of fine art, high art. And she's directing the artist who is this, uh, this naked youth in the direction of the only things that are worth talking about from a, a young Poland artistic point of view. And that is the natural world. So you see the, the sunflowers, but a very kind of simple, modest, uh, humble kind of nature. Uh, you know, sunflowers are sort of everyday um, friendly flowers, you know, they're, they're nothing too sophisticated, nothing too ornate. Uh, and the Polish landscape, which you can see uh, at the bottom of the picture, and then finally, this young girl is dressed in traditional Krakowian peasant outfit. Uh, and this uh, focus on the material culture of the, the peasantry um, and of, of, sort of the indigenous Polish peoples from different parts of Poland is something that is incredibly important to young Polish culture. So the uh, the first two pictures I showed you um, I sort of have uh, have Krakow at their their center, um, but this is a, a, a depiction of another really important location of Young Poland, and that's the Tatra Mountains. So the Tatra Mountains um, was like Krakow, also in the Austro-Hungarian partition um, of Poland. Um, and it was a, um, a, an area of the Carpathian mountain range with a very specific um, culture, a very specific heritage. And you can see at the background here, um, there is a mountain range that if you look carefully, looks like uh, a sleeping giant. So you can see the sort of the torso in the middle and then there's a dip slightly to the right to form the neck. And then it looks like a head, you know, a head of someone lying on their back. 
And this is a legend um, about a, a giant or a sleeping knight who will come awake one day and liberate Poland. So again, this, um, it, it looks like a painting and actually it's not, it's textile. This textile uh, art is, is also based on the idea that even though, yes, it's nighttime, yes, this is a scene of hard work and struggle and, and perhaps melancholy, you know, the colours again have this sort of melancholy, um, sort of uh, gentle air, there is again this potential for something to happen and Poland maybe will wake up and will be liberated and things will get better. Moving around the exhibition, uh, the next section is about Stanislav Wyspiansky. Um, this is such an important part of the exhibition, I couldn't miss it out, but I'm not going to focus too much on Wyspiansky because I know Julia will be speaking about him later. But I just wanted to illustrate really um, how much there is in the exhibition about Wyspiansky and how, um, how much work he, he did in different sorts of, different sorts of media. So um, at the back of the image there, you, you see a portrait that is a, a self-portrait of Wyspiansky uh, sporting one of, the, one of the top three moustaches in the Young Poland movement, I would say. Um, and there's, there's some good ones. Um, and then you see uh, on the left, um, some chairs and a, a drawing um, and then a, a costume slightly behind that which I'll show in more detail later. So this is all to do with Wyspiansky's playwriting uh, and also stage uh, design and scenography. On the right hand side there are examples of his book arts um, and also um, his interest in the applied arts societies in Poland uh, and also to do with his preservation of historic buildings. And then moving around the exhibition, uh, you would see these fantastic uh, pastel um, floral designs, which are from the, for the Franciscan church in Krakow. Um, and it was great that Rowan showed Morris's trellis design earlier because some of these are so similar um, to, how, uh, to how Morris does that, did his own designing. Um, so really, really interesting um, to see the parallels between Morris's way of abstracting natural forms um, and creating kind of flat abstracted pattern uh, on a on a grid like surface um, alongside Wyspiansky's uh, way of doing something similar and on the right you see the spectacular stained glass window um, which is a modern recreation made to Wyspiansky's design uh, by by Polish master craftsman Piotr Ostrowski. So that was room one in the exhibition. Uh, there's plenty more to go. So you would, in the gallery, you would go up the stairs, uh, escorted, and you can just see at the back of this picture by a very handsome gentleman with a, another fantastic moustache wearing traditional Highlander outfits. So uh, metaphorically, you are coming up up the stairs to the mountains. And this focuses on the um, aspect of young Poland, um, which is the, um, the Zakopane style. Uh, I'm just going to move that slide back. Thank you. Uh, so the Zakopane style, uh, Zakopane is a town in the Tatra Mountains and became a locus for young Poland uh, artists and uh, ideas and art. Um, and the amazing object you can see in the, the center here is a fantastic scale model um, of a house um, that was built um, in Zakopane. The architect was uh, Stanislav Viskiewicz, uh, who is, you can see him just behind, uh, looking over his creation. Um, and this, uh, this house called the House Under the Furs was an archetypal example of how um, the Zakopane style of architecture took traditional Polish peasant culture uh, and really um, uh, translated it into fantastic new type of, of high art, essentially. Uh, so this incredibly sophisticated architecture came from um, an interest in the peasant material culture of, of Poland, and particularly that of the Highlanders who lived in this, in this area of, of the Tatra Mountains. And one of the best things about the exhibition has been the ability to show objects from private collections uh, in, in Zakopane. So um, the, the big house model that we saw, that's in, a, that's in a, a museum that you can go and see. But there is another house um, in Zakopane uh, called the Silent Villa. And this is still in private hands. And we were so lucky to get these objects, um, which have been taken from the, the house. Um, so they are um, owned by the granddaughter of an artist called Karol Klozowski. 
Uh, Klozowski, I think, even to Polish people, is not a is not a household name. Um, there has been almost no exhibitions of his art, uh, certainly not outside of Poland. But Klozowski was a self-taught artist who um, moved to a house in Zakopane and then proceeded to translate the whole place into a, a work of art. Um, and the way he did this was in various ways, but the most spectacular to my mind is the wood carving. So you see this fantastic door on the right hand side, uh, which is all made by hand carved wood. Uh, it was the door to the, his studio um, and in the door it says Aurora Muses Amica, which is Latin for dawn is the friend of the muses, which basically means, you know, get up, do some work. Uh, and this is what Klozowski was fantastic at, you know, his work ethic, his amazing ability to translate um, kind of traditional craft forms into works of art. Um, and he, he dedicated his whole life to, to this essentially. So we have here the wood carving on the right hand side and this fantastic kilim, a woven textile on the left hand side showing a, a traditional story about um, kind of like a Robin Hood type characters. So bandits who take, uh, who take from, the, uh, from the, the rich and give to the poor. And then this next slide also shows um, shows Klozowski's output, which included paper cuttings, lace designs, uh, paper cuttings, lace designs, um, and um, also uh, portraits of his family. So the, the lady, the very um, striking lady that you see there, that was his wife. So the next room in the exhibition uh, is dedicated to the work of Maria Pavlikowska Jasnozewska. Uh, and Maria is known uh, again in Poland as uh, she's very well known as a poet and a playwright. But what I think people um, my from my conversations with Polish visitors to the exhibition is that people are less familiar with her as a artist. Um, and Maria was an um, extraordinary artist. She was an extraordinary woman. Um, she was married three times um, and her second husband, uh, who you see in the portrait on the lower left hand side, uh, was a man called Jasz Pawlikowski and his father owned the house under the furs, which is the model, the big model that we saw a couple of slides ago. So that's the connection. So Maria and Yash lived in Zakopane and spent a lot of time there and a lot of her work is inspired by, by Zakopane and that's how she fits into the Young Poland movement. But as an artist in her own right, um, I think she's extraordinary uh, and the kind of the, the humour and the feminism and the self-confidence uh, and the kind of the gender, um, sort of the, the acknowledgement of the complicated nature of gender roles and sort of a bit of playfulness with that is something that's really um, comes out in her drawings. So especially what you see this at the lower right hand side is, is a portrait of herself looking imperious, beautiful, confident with this sort of supplicant elf um, on the on the lower on the on her hand who is quite possibly her husband uh, so it's an interesting sort of take on sort of gender roles in their in their family uh, Maria and Yash then divorced and she married a third time um, and this was uh, to a, a pilot um, and so Maria and her pilot actually were political refugees. They came to England at the start of the Second World War. Uh, her, uh, her partner fought in the Battle of Britain um, and then um, she very sadly died of cancer in 1945. So her, her um, legacy is not as well known in this country as I think it should be and I think if she'd lived longer she would have been an interesting part of the post-war cultural scene. And then the final room of the exhibition is dedicated, as Rowan briefly mentioned, to the Krakow workshops. So the workshops were uh, and one of these sort of arts and crafts collectives organisations of people who um, were intending to improve the cause of, of Polish design or of their national design. As um, Rowan mentioned, that one of the main um, sort of reactions of the arts and crafts movement was to the Industrial Revolution. Poland was still a pre-industrial society really at that time, but the context of occupation and partition meant that um, there was a real desire to maintain traditional Polish culture as opposed to the cheap imports that were coming from the occupying powers who were much more industrialized, particularly Germany. So the crack of workshops are certainly a reaction to cheap mass imports. Um, and they also um, are benefiting from the fact that Krakow is part of the Austrian hung uh, Hungarian partition. And of course, Vienna is part of this partition too, or it's part of it's, you know, it's part of the country, uh, the partitioning country. And 
as a result, the young Poland artists who work in Krakow have, um, have a, a link with Vienna and they know about the Wiener Werkstatt. Sorry, my slides are a little bit jumping. I'm not quite sure why that's happening. But anyway, the, um, my favorite things in this part of the exhibition are the textiles. And you can see here two different sorts of textiles. There's um, a, uh, there are kilim, which are these woven textiles behind. And then you see an outfit, which I think looks incredibly modern, much more modern than sort of the 1920s um, period that it comes from. And that's in batik, which is a form of um, the dyeing textiles using wax that was originated in Java. And it came over to Europe um, as a result of, sort of the Dutch um, traders. Um, and it was all the rage around Europe sort of around 1900. Um, and what they did at the Krakow workshops was they, they had a, a school of batik uh, where they employed women who were not traditionally educated in the arts and asked them to design according to their imagination, essentially. And so they, uh, the Krakow workshops produced these fantastically beautiful traditionally inspired objects, um, but much less um, interested in the forms of the past. So they are less kind of copying forms of the past, but they're much more interested in sort of the spirit of, of peasant culture and in the spirit of, of the history of Poland. Uh, and so they're creating things that look much more modern, uh, but also have um, a real kind of indigenous feel um, and a real sort of indigenous color to them. And I think the, the objects in the crack of workshop section really show um, how this interest in folk culture could become not just looking backwards and not just historic, but actually very modern. And this, I think, uh, is no better illustrated than in these fantastic uh, Christmas decorations. So these um, were a, a part of the exhibition that was created by a contemporary artist. They are based on lost original, some existing and some lost originals of Christmas decorations, paper decorations created at the Krakow workshops. Um, and the artist Anna mishkowska sheshka created these for us uh, in double size using all traditional methods. So they are a a reaction initially to cheap imported German glass baubles that were kind of you know shiny, mass produced, not terribly um, not terribly nice, uh, according to the young Poland artists, um, and they are an attempt to really capture a historic. Uh, feel and also historic craft techniques. So everything is made from paper and other natural materials. They are folded, there's minimal glue used. The eyes of some of these um, beautiful creations are made of beans. The bodies of, you can see there's some pigs um, and some fish and they are made from blown eggs. And so everything is natural. Everything is made from you know paper um, and and traditional sources. But equally, you know, these are very modern looking and they've been extremely popular in the exhibition. Um, and it's, I think it's a way of showing that we've almost come full circle in what we like um, in our own society, you know, our own interest in craft and hand created objects, as Rowan said, is something that I think is in resurgence um, because we are saturated uh, with mass produced lower quality objects. And I think the interest in the handmade is something that, you know, is coming back again and again. So just very quickly, um, here is a, a little video. Well, this is a, a in the exhibition, you could see a video um, that gives you more context. And so that is available on our YouTube site. So please do have a look at that if you're interested in more context about um, the objects on display. And then outside the gallery, if you were to come, you would see this fantastic uh, sculpture by Martin Rusek. So unfortunately, Tamara from Martin Rusek Studio is not able to speak to us about that today. Um, but I do encourage you, as Sophie said, to, to have a look um, at their website and to see the inspiration behind it, because it was fantastic to have this made specifically for the Young Poland exhibition. And again, it speaks to the, um, the extent to which Young Poland remains an inspiration for contemporary artists. So very quickly, uh, I know I've only got about eight minutes left. So the next, um, the next little part of the talk is behind the scenes. So we have had a lot, of, this is a big exhibition, especially for somewhere quite small like the gallery. There's about 150 objects. 148 of them have come from Poland. So there's been a lot of um, logistics. There's about 20 lenders, uh, both institutionals uh, and private individuals. Um, and so it's been a really interesting and you know, challenging logistical process. So I just wanted to very quickly talk through how we did that, really. Um, the 
exhibition started because my colleague and co-curator Julia, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, gave a very popular talk at the gallery about two and a half years ago. It was so popular she had to do it twice. So we realised that there was a really um, big interest in Young Poland. We have a big Polish community in Walthamstow, but also I think non-Polish people realised they knew nothing about Polish art and design. I certainly knew very, very little. Um, it's not something that we have really exhibited in this country much before. And so we felt that there was a real opportunity to show people something new, to see something different. So Julia set to work um, compiling a fantastically ambitious um, and beautiful object list. And you can see here, this is what a museum object list sort of looks like. So we have, um, we put the picture on, very important. We put a description, where it's from, also very important. Dimensions, hugely important for the exhibition designers. And, and we took it from there. So we had this huge working spreadsheet um, that had all the information on and new things would be added and taken away. Um, but this was kind of, this is the core working document that we would have used to, to think about, you know, the structure of the exhibition, the design of it, the size of it. We were really lucky to be working with the Polish Cultural Institute uh, in London and also the National Museum in Krakow, who are our institutional partners. So the, the development of the exhibition you know, relied hugely on them and on their input. And we also had two fantastic exhibition designers. Uh, so generally with exhibition design, you have a 3D designer who works out the object placement, to make sure everything fits. And then a 2D designer who thinks about color, about labels, about graphic identity, that kind of thing. So these are some examples of the 3D design, which was done by Simon Millthorpe. Um, and this is uh, the, the room of the last, um, the last objects that I showed you. So you can see it's an odd shaped room. The, the gallery's exhibitions um, are, exhibition spaces are generally historic spaces. So we have to work with the historic architecture of the building. So you can see this one has a, has a bay window. There are limitations because it has, you know, it's a listed building. It has, you know, delicate ceilings, um, you know, there's panels. It's, you know, it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. So we have to think quite hard about the best way to incorporate all the objects in a way that is safe for the building, safe for the visitors and safe for the objects. So we went through many, many iterations of the exhibition design. And then at the same time, we're thinking about colours, we're thinking about identity, um, we're thinking about, you know, what is both modern and interesting and nice for visitors to come and look at, not too dark, not too gloomy, but also in keeping with the Young Poland movement. You know, you can't have white walls if it's if it's an exhibition about, you know, colour and about historic design um, so much. So this is a, a behind the scenes photo from the day that we tested a lot of different paints. Uh, so you can see there's lots of paint samples there. There's lots of ways of, you know, testing different sorts of colours. And we eventually came up with three, this kind of teal uh, and two sort of you know, reddish shades to complement the paintings um, and other works on display. And then the build happens. So the build was done by a fantastic local um, model maker, joiner, sort of all round wizard, um, whose name is Odell, who does a lot of the building at the gallery. And there was a huge structure needed to be built for the stained glass. So that was a real, again, logistical challenge um, because we don't have much space to build in. Um, and there is a lot of objects in the exhibition. So the central feature, which has the stained glass, which you can see being constructed here, was really crucial because that gave us four extra surfaces essentially to work on, which which is something that was really necessary uh, due to the size of the project. And then the art starts to arrive. Um, and this is always really exciting. Uh, it was also, uh, in this case, you know, again, uh, you know, not, not easy because, we, again, we're a small building in some respects. Uh, and some of the objects were too big to fit in the building um, in their crates. So they all arrive in these huge crates that you see on the right to keep them safe during the, the journey from Poland. Um, but then the doors are only small in the, in the gallery because you know, it's a 19th, an 18th century house. So the uh, art technicians had to sometimes um, uncrate things you know, outside of the exhibition space, which is not ideal, but they were fantastic. Um, but it, you know, it really uh, was a logistical challenge and it was something you know, very interesting to observe um, about you know, how the best, the best practice of doing that in limited space, um, in limited spaces, and you know they were they were fantastic art handlers from Poland. So we're looking forward to welcoming them, welcoming them back next week when we do the deinstall. 
And I'd say the biggest uh, logistical technical challenge was the fantastic model that I showed you. Um, that had to be brought in the back the back way because it wouldn't fit through the front door. It was then had to be dismantled under the supervision of a fantastic conservator um, who came over from the Tatra Museum in Zakopane who owns this model uh, and she was absolutely fantastic and she helped us uh, dismantle it so that then it could be carried safely upstairs and then reassembled upstairs for the visitors. And then we think about kind of the smaller aspects of display. So on the left, you can see this is my desk um, with some wooden blocks because, you know, we were thinking about the best way to show these beautiful small objects. Um, and, you know, we liked the idea of using natural materials in keeping with the Young Poland movement, nicer than plastic um, or, you know, perspex or other sorts of things. Um, so this was me playing with these wooden blocks um, to see what the best way of exhibiting them was. Um, and I think it, it has worked nicely actually with these small little objects um, from the crack of workshops, the toys, the decorations, and really in keeping with them. And then the objects start to arrive. And this is really, really exciting. We start opening everything up. Um, so on the left, we see um, the technicians working hard uh, to install some of the, uh, the Vispiansky's objects. And on the right, you see Julia um, with the, uh, the king's costume designed by Vispiansky. And this was marvelous. This had never been shown outside of Poland before and to have it, uh, in the gallery, you know, expertly um, put on the mannequin by fantastic conservator who came over was really, really exciting, really emotional time. So it's, you know, you've been working, especially because of the pandemic, we were working 99% on screens, not in the archives, not with the objects. Um, so to actually have the physical things on site was really, really special. And then, of course, you know, there was aspects like the Christmas decorations. So there's Julia again working very hard. Uh, one Sunday morning, I think we came in to do the Christmas decorations. Um, but again, you know, this really tactile, exciting um, part of, of working on the exhibition was really getting hands on and you know, having the objects and realizing how beautiful they were going to be and hoping that visitors would see that in the same way as us. Uh, and of course, there was also a lot of product development going on behind the scenes. My colleagues are in the retail commercial side of things. Um, so we were also really excited to be able to you know, have things in the shop to try and you know, promote the exhibition. Um, and there are still some things available in the shop on the online shop. So do please do please have a look at that. And that's it. So thank you very much for watching. Um, that's my contact details. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. And we do have a specific Young Poland website. Um, so please do also have a look at that uh, if you'd like more information. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Rasheen. And yes, we can send out all the information about websites as well when I do a roundup next week. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, it was really great to see the exhibition in that live tour. Um, I really felt like I was actually there in the room, which was fantastic and really great to understand more about the curatorial process. I learned a lot there. So we've got some great questions come through. So if I can just bring Rowan and Rasheen back, I will get started. So Rowan, the first one is for you. Uh, was there an awareness or influence of African art in these movements, especially in Britain? Um, the short answer would be probably not, not so much. Um, William Morris had some North African textiles in his collection, we know he was looking at, but that's particularly kind of Ottoman influenced um, North, North African countries like, like Egypt and Morocco. Um, so. Morris particularly was looking more, had a wider awareness of Middle Eastern textiles and, and Indian textiles as well. Um, I guess I would, I would imagine that there might have been some knowledge, but I think probably we think of, I guess, African knowledge of African art movements come, or coming in or in, the, in the 20th century with Cubism particularly. So um, I'm sure someone, It'd be interesting to know if anybody has done particular studies on this, um, some, something that I don't know enough about, but broadly I'd say less so than other, other places. Brilliant, yeah, and actually if anybody does have any information, please do share it in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, next question as well for you, Rowan. Um, how did the established artists, those who were in the finer art circles, respond to this movement? How did the established artists? So I think the person I said, sorry, Rowan. So do you mean, uh, so yeah, I say um, 
there was there was I guess sometimes tension um for example particularly when it came to politics in art I'd say um then for example William Morris for example um when he became a socialist and and tried to very much kind of transform use his art but maybe sometimes turn away from his art and think more about how actually political change had to happen. There, there could be a tension between artists, some who felt art oh, fake oh, rather than um, artists as a kind of social movement. So there could be tension. Um, it's, I guess, a complex, a, com a more complex question. Um, We lost you a little bit at the end there, Rowan. Um, but I know as well from 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 looking around the gallery that there was the kind of Morris was responding or responding against, I suppose, some of the um, Victorian uh, sort of I forget the phrasing that we use often in our tours, but the the fancy art that was very busy and not kind of influenced by that more simplistic kind of medieval style. So I suppose. Uh, to some extent, there was that tension there, as, as you've explained. Thank you. And then we have one last question for you, Rowan. Uh, oh, sorry, no, apologies, I have two more for you. So was the arts and crafts movement an interpretation of peasant art, or did the everyday person recognise their craft, especially in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, did 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 people to peasants feel that they Sorry, Rowan, just interject. We've lost you again. Um, I wonder if you move slightly closer to the screen. Maybe it might might help. Do you want to try it? Try again. We didn't hear if you start from the beginning of your answer. Um. I'm not sure that's working either. Sorry, Rowan. Um, we'll, we'll move on to questions for Rasheen and we'll try and come back to you later. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, okay, so Rasheen, we have a question about um, the name. So why is it called Young Poland? And I think the person asking the question is referring to both our exhibition, but also the movement itself. Oh, well, that's a fantastic, <laughs> it's a fantastic question. Um, so it, the word, the expression in Polish is Mloda Polska. Um, and which we've translated as Young Poland. Um, and I think the, well, so the reason that we've called it that is because that, that's, that's the best translation that we could think of um, into English. Um, but I think it's, it's, the idea is that this is a, a new resurgence. This is a, a youthful moment. You know, it, I, some of the objects that I showed at the beginning, and there was a, there's another fantastic one in the exhibition that's it's literally called Spring. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, out of darkness, out of, sort of the old, something new is emerging, something new and um, exciting and, and youthful is coming. And so I guess it captures the essence of um, this idea of, of a new start, uh, of, of something better, something brighter, um, you know, the, the beginnings of something else, something other. Um, and so that's, that's why, um, that, you know, that to me, that, that's the interpretation of young. Uh, it's kind of, you know, a spring, a spring of, of new art um, and that association with, with the new. Fantastic. Thank you, Rasheen. Um, I also have a question, actually. I'm interested in understanding more about the Zakopane region. Do you know why that region specifically was chosen as um, sort of a point of inspiration as opposed to other folk or farming areas in Poland? The Zakopane region had um, a really rich indigenous culture to begin with. Um, and I spoke uh, in the first couple of slides about peasant culture. That's not actually strictly accurate for the specific region of Zakopane because they had not had a feudal system. So there were not serfs, so there were not peasants as such. Uh, so the best way of thinking about the, in the indigenous inhabitants of Zakopane is as highlanders. So these sort of, um, rural folk uh, who live um, in this sort of very secluded, area um, and have this very rich culture especially of wood carving um, and of, of, of other um, material culture. Um, Zakopane became um, a centre for um, 
because of its mountainous um, aspect, it became a center for kind of um, people who were unwell. So people suffering from tuberculosis and other things, um, it became a center where people would go to recover, recuperate, I suppose, in the same way that people in England went to the seaside, you know, to, to Bath to, you know, to get the airs. And so Zakopane became a, a focus for, um, for that. And then also it was, as I mentioned, in the Austro-Hungarian partition, which was relatively more liberal than the other two um, partitioned areas owned by Prussia and Russia. So there was a certainly, I don't think there's any, it's not a coincidence that both of the sites of the Young Poland movement are in this Austro-Hungarian partition. So I, I think it feels like a perfect storm really in Zakopane um, that you get, you know, um, this rich culture, you get the beautiful landscape and uh, a desirable place to be. It's not that far from Krakow, um, and it's in this Austrian partition. And then, of course, like anything, once you get some people there, I guess it attracts others. And, it, you know, it, it's a bit like the Cotswolds in England, um, that, you know, people then start to recognise it as an artistic hub, as somewhere where artists go. Um, and then, you know, it becomes sort of self-perpetuating um, a little bit in that sense. Fantastic. Thank you, Rasheen. That was very thorough. Uh, okay, one more question for you, Rasheen. What was the relationship between the Young Poland movement and the Catholic Church in Poland? Mm -hmm. Was the church a patron at all? Well, that's an excellent um, question, and I'm, I hope Julia might be able to answer that a bit more um, in her in her later talks, because um, she knows much more about it than me. Certainly, the Catholic faith was a really important part of Polish cultural identity at this time, and um, a, a painting that I didn't show in the exhibition um, is a fantastic um, image which shows a peasant at a um, at a roadside shrine, and this is a kind of a, so the peasant is barefoot, you know, he's very poor, he's a ragged clothes he's in this beautiful um polish landscape and the the christ figure the crucified christ in the shrine is coming alive and sort of speaking to him so there's this closeness between um the the christ figure and the peasant and this idea that there is a spirituality inherent in craft and a spirituality inherent in in the humble um, people who do it is a really important um, moment in, in sort of young Poland ideology. Uh, and there are certainly commissions that are associated with the church. So, for example, um, the um, designs that I showed you that um, are were the floral patterns on a background, they were done for the Franciscan church in Krakow, and there were other church related commissions. Um, there was a bit of tension between sort of the radical imagery of, of young Poland um, of design and sort of the expectations of the church. So some church authorities were not thrilled by the kind of over um, simplification of, or sort of the, or the over emphasis on sort of the simple life that was associated with young Poland. Uh, and so some of the commissions were a bit controversial, but certainly, yes, there was there was a relationship. Um, and I think even if we're not talking about the kind of the established church as such, there's definitely a spirituality inherent. So if people have seen the posters for the Young Poland exhibition, um, it shows a, a girl concentrating on lace work. This is Karol Klosowski's drawing of his daughter. And there's definitely something of the Virgin Mary about her. She has this kind of halo of lace behind her head um, that looks very religious. Uh, and the kind of the concentration on her face, it's, it's very reminiscent of pictures of the Virgin Mary reading, for example, at the Annunciation. And so her concentration on her craft has a spiritual holy air to it, I think. Um, so the idea that there is a spirituality, even if it's not sort of traditionally um, established religion, but a spiritual spirituality inherent in the production of craft is a really significant aspect of, of young Poland thought. Fantastic. Thank you, Rasheen. Yeah, there's definitely lots of influence throughout the movement from, like you say, from Catholicism and also spiritualism more broadly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and go back to Rowan and see if it works. So Rowan, do you want to just, just do a little test? Hi, right. can you hear me? Yes, at the moment we can. So let's give it a shot. So the question I asked previously was, uh, was the arts and crafts movement an interpretation of peasant art or did the everyday person recognise their craft, especially in Central and Eastern Europe? I think people would have recognised their craft, um, whether they saw it as something that they um, wanted to kind of continue because of this artistic movement championing it is another question. Um, obviously, the attraction of the new and new affordable products and um, kind of cheap manufactured goods was of course attractive to people and was seen as 
improving people's everyday lives. So, um, so there was a te probably a tension there about whether people want to kind of romanticize their own. We lost you at the very end, but we heard most of it. Thank you, Rowan. I'll put uh, one last question to Rasheen. So we have one more for you, Rasheen. Did uh, the young Poland craftspeople in the movement, did they make vestments? Oh, that is a really interesting question. <laughs> and I might need to defer to my expert, uh, resident expert, Julia, about that. I didn't see any reference to vestments in the um, object list, but it wouldn't surprise me given that they made everything. You know, so textiles are a really important part of the Young Poland movement. Um, but I would need to, I will check that over the lunch break. Um, and I'm sure Julia already knows the answer, but I will check that and see whether I can find any reference to that. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting point. And I could certainly see why that would be a case because Young Poland artists were really interested in the idea of total design, you know, Vispiansky designs everything. Um, and for some of his buildings, he designs textiles as well as, as other aspects of it. So that is a really, really interesting point. Um, and that sounds like that would have been a great addition to the exhibition if they do exist. Great. Thank you, Rasheen. Yes, some research over the break. And actually, I, there's one more question for Rowan, but I think I'll post it to Rowan and we'll, we'll write the answer in the chat so you guys can have that when you get back from the break. OK, brilliant. Well, that then brings us to our lunch break. Thank you very much to Rowan and Rasheen for those fascinating talks and answering of the questions. After the break, we're going to be hearing from two more speakers um, before another break and then our final speaker of the day. So please um, take a comfort break. We've got half an hour. We've got until 12.45 and we very much look forward to seeing you back here in half an hour. Hello, 